Welcome to the third episode in the Legendarium about Medieval Knights. Today we'll be talking about the fall of the Medieval Fighting Man. All things that have a beginning have an end, and so do the Medieval Knights. In 1300, the armies of Europe looked very much like this, but by 1500, they looked more like this. As we get from here to there, we'll be talking about the changing face of Europe, the changing face of war, the knights' culture of casual carnage, the Battle of Agincourt, new tournaments that were fought in a new Europe. Things began to change fast during the late Middle Ages. In 1315, the Great Famine caused greater hardship than ever known before, as harvests dropped, prices rose, and people went without food. The desperate began to abandon their own children in the woods and even turn to cannibalism, robbing graves in order to fill the table. Yum yum. And just a generation later, in 1314, the Black Plague slashed the population down by a third, leaving whole villages empty, mills idle, and urban neighborhoods populated only by ghosts. However, the peasants who survived were in a position to call the shots, demanding that they be paid cash to work the Lord's land. After all, there were very few peasants left to work it, so they could insist on such things. The proud knights answered their complaints by chopping off some of their hands. Not surprisingly, the peasants rose up in rebellion across Europe, expressing their displeasure with the status quo by burning tax records, ransacking the houses of the rich, and generally being a nuisance. And though most of these rebellions ended with mass hangings, knights simply couldn't make the world go back to the way it was. There weren't as many peasants anymore, and they could be paid if they wanted it. With their income from land rents drying up, knights had to find other sources of income. The legitimate way was to hire oneself out as a mercenary for whoever needed somebody killed. But since they already knew how to fight and enjoyed lashings of the old ultraviolence, knights turned to robbing merchants on the roads or kidnapping the members of rich families for ransom. The rich merchants, newly wealthy as trade went from local to national to global, really got up the noses of the knights. Mere peasants who built five-story houses filled with Persian rugs, ancient artworks, fine tapestries, and armies of servants, often far nicer than anything the declining knightly class had. In fact, on some occasions, when the knights waylaid merchants in the forest, they would chop off their hands to teach them a lesson in respect. And no doubt to their shock, that didn't change things. In fact, it might bring them a royal or imperial summons, since unlike the knights, merchants paid taxes and kings did not want those cash cows being milked by somebody else. In addition, warfare was changing. As the late Middle Ages marched on, innovation became the watchword of warfare. All sorts of new weapons appeared on the battlefield, many making use of this wonderful new thing called gunpowder. They could be as simple as a leather siege bell supported by a timber frame and a central wooden strut so strong that arrows and masonry bits would just bounce off it, and the two men inside could walk up to the front gate and plant a bomb. Medieval tanks even started to appear, in the form of wagons covered with plate armor pulled by teams of horses, themselves protected by wood and steel screens. These wagons would be lined with cannons that blew holes in enemy lines or bombarded enemy walls. A small field cannon called culverins might not be accurate, but the noise terrified knights' horses, and often knights themselves. Another rig, called the Crayfish, went this way and that on four speeding wheels, kindling munitions and shooting steel buckshot. Some chroniclers even described primitive diving suits with frog-mouthed helmets, which had a tube attached to the frog mouth, and the tube was attached to a bellows which pumped air in and allowed a diver to stay underwater for ten minutes at a stretch. But one of the most remarkable stories of machine and man during this changing time was Sir Gotts von Berlichingen, a German imperial knight who represented the Old Order, and early in his career he got into an argument with a part of the New Order, namely a cannon. He lost. He also lost one of his hands. However, the Old Knight went to one of the men of the New Age for his problem. Specifically, the tool makers of Nuremberg, the Silicon Valley of its time, the inventors of the first pocket watch, and they made him an iron prosthesis, which every one of the fingers could be moved, allowing Berlichingen to grip his reins, grab his sword, and even throw a ball. 
and with his other hand he could bend his fingers as he pleased, returning them to position with a button. It had a total of 152 pieces, including hinges, gears, and springs, and it was definitely a sign of where things were heading. Now, one of the things that made the Knights Knights was the culture of judicial duels. If two knights got into a legal argument over accusations of adultery or treason or heresy or some other nastiness, and there wasn't enough evidence or witnesses to convince the judge one way or another, then the judge would simply order the knights to meet at dawn for a duel. And this conjures up images of expert swordsmen meeting at dawn just outside town, swords at the ready, ready to do battle for honor unto death. However, some of these contests seem to have been designed more for the purpose of entertaining the game masters than anyone else. In England, for example, two knights met not with swords, but with ram's horns, which immediately broke, and the two men were reduced to wrestling and biting each other. One man bit the other's member off, and the other, no doubt in a violent rage, took out the second man's eye with his thumb. The eyeless man cried peace and was immediately hung as the duel found him guilty. The man without a member went on to a new career as a monk. And there were even cases where women got in on the action. Now, in cases where women had to fight judicial duels, the game masters operated under the theory that a woman was worth half a man. So they would force the man to be buried up to his waist and use a wooden mace in combat. And while the woman was free to move around him, she had to use a rock wrapped in her wedding veil as a weapon which was judged appropriate for the woman. And if you're curious to know, the case described in this book actually ended with a victory for the woman. However, these judicial duels might be entertaining to us, but the kings weren't so fond of them. They wanted cases to be settled in court. After all, all of this violence was bad for business. It could lead to feuds as losers sought revenge on winners, and they wanted those merchants to be able to move those goods as they pleased through the kingdom without having to worry about getting their limbs chopped off. Now, as if this cult of violence wasn't enough of a liability for the knights, they just weren't that good in battle anymore. We've talked about plenty of new weapons, and the most devastating of all of them was the longbow. The longbow was about as tall as the man using it, which gave the archer a long draw, which led to an arrow shot strong enough to hammer through plate armor. Chivalric armies began using them in great numbers around the 1400s, and chivalry would not survive. At the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, King Henry V of England deployed his archers on the flanks of his line behind a wall of sharpened wooden stakes. And when the French knights charged the English position with banners streaming and plumes soaring in the air and their armor glowing in the sun, they got mowed down. The English longbowmen produced enough arrows to darken the sun, supposedly. And even worse, the ground at Agincourt had been turned into a morass by heavy rain. Ironically, the French knights could have easily just avoided the mud by riding through the forests on either side of the English line, but chivalry demanded a glorious charge across the field, and in the case of the French knights, it led to an inglorious death in the mud. Those lucky enough to not be killed by arrows arrived exhausted and disorganized, with many sinking into the mud because of their heavy armor. And once the French force got close enough, the English archers traded their bows for pole axes and lead mallets. And in the massacre that followed, peasant soldiers working for three pence a day managed to slaughter ten thousand knights, many of whom could probably claim glorious family lineages going back 500 years, which obviously did them no good in combat anymore. So what's going to happen to chivalry? Knights are obsolete. New generations of kings are more interested in taxes than in chivalry. They're getting tired of the robber knights waylaying merchants who are worth more than them. 
Yet, chivalry became more popular than ever, but not on the battlefield where it was worthless. After all, they'd recently invented another device called the halberd, which was actually designed to pry open bits of metal armor to slash the tendons of horses, and then finally a mercy dagger, which was used to put both the knight and chivalry out of his mercy. But if knights hadn't won in the battlefield, they had won culturally. It wasn't just knights showing up for these grand and lavish tournaments, which became days-long affairs that recreated the battles of King Arthur and Charlemagne and Roland and all of these great heroes who had been around since the early Middle Ages. It was also open to merchants who could actually afford these golden suits of armor filled with elaborate designs of dragons and lions. You could now buy your way into chivalry, and these epic suits of armor that you see in the Graz Armory in Austria were the medieval equivalent of a Ferrari. Very, very expensive. And instead of competing for a spot working for a noble lord in a new career as a knight, the knights, or at least the merchants who were playing knights, were instead competing for ladies' favor in elaborate play acting, where the ladies would give them kerchiefs that they would wear into battle to show that they were jousting for this or that lady. So chivalry had become theater. But what about the people who used to live by chivalry? Well, you had one of two choices. Number one, you could cling desperately to your privileges. You could fight tooth and nail the forces that were changing Europe and you would end up the loser for it. With rents drying up and peasants beginning to move off the land and more farmland being used for sheep instead of wheat, the knights grew poor and knights who refused to change wound up dressed in rags and tatters, living in hovels with nothing but a mangy bit of sable fur to show that they were not peasants. However, if you were willing to bend a little, you could survive the storm. Some knights married into rich merchant families. The knights brought status that the merchants craved, and the knights brought and the merchants brought money the knights desperately needed. Knights learned how to use their small bits of land profitably, using it for sheep farming instead of wheat. They also found new work as royal counselors, captains in reformed armies with new weapons, and entering the civil service. And so the story of the knights ended not with a great slaughter, but just a career change. And that wraps things up for the Knights episode on The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, please leave it in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me. And next week, we'll be starting a series on medieval Russia.